Good morning, everyone. Welcome to Waverly Road Presbyterian Church. Uh, just a couple of announcements this morning. First of all, uh, next week we will have communion. And thanks to uh, Robin McMillan, who's, who leads our Sanctuary Guild, uh, we have some new communion cups <laughs> that are individually individual serving. So um, I hope they're better than the other ones. They're certainly easier to open. However, you are free also to bring your own communion elements next week if you prefer to do that. And if you're uh, watching at home, you're uh, certainly welcome to have communion with us uh, while you sit at home. You can have your own communion elements and, and join with us as the body of Christ, wherever you may be. Also, uh, we are, uh, the, the session is wrestling with the question about what to do about worship arrangements. Um, we had originally hoped to have everything back to normal by the 1st of August, but of course we have a, a new outbreak in the pandemic. And uh, we have guidance that's coming out that's confusing and, and is vexing to people. Uh, so we, we're not sure what we're going to do. In the meantime, I want to assure you that anyone who feels uncomfortable about being in public uh, or is vulnerable should protect themselves. And we are all for that. And so no matter what your circumstance, we hope you will put your safety first. You can choose to wear a mask at any time and you will not be criticized for doing that. Um, and certainly, if you feel you need to worship at home until this latest outbreak passes, you can certainly do that. Uh, that, that is highly encouraged because we care about people. Um, I also want you to know that, as far as I know, that everybody up here is vaccinated. So, and we do have a high vaccination rate in our congregation. But this is a public space, as far as I'm concerned, on Sunday mornings. And we welcome everyone. So you don't know who might be here. So if you, if you feel vulnerable, you're welcome to take steps to protect yourself until, the, until we decide if we want to change our policy on that. Uh, are there any other announcements? Oh, thank you, thank you, thank you. I don't know why I forget the five cents a meal. I should never forget. That should be number one. Uh, we have a basket in the narthex that's for five cents a meal. And um, so please don't forget to put your donations for this worthy food ministry in the basket before you leave church this morning. Thank you. Is there anything, any other announcements? <laughs> no. <laughs> then let us turn our hearts and minds toward God and worship him, all of us, together. Let us pray. O Lord, our Good Shepherd, 
You are the source of all true and lasting joy. We praise you for your power, which is beyond compare. We worship you for your wisdom, which is beyond understanding. You can meet all our needs. You restore the brokenhearted and heal the wounded. You have revealed yourself to your people and are building your church against which the gates of hell cannot prevail. How great you are, Lord. Fill our hearts with love as we respond by singing praises to you. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Please join me in the call to worship. In the ancient days of Jesus 28, God spoke to Jacob and said, Behold, I am with you and will keep you wherever you go and will bring you back to this land, for I will not leave you until I have done what I have promised you. In Psalm 16, we know from ancient times that the presence of God is good and is given to those who seek him. You make known to me the path of life. In your presence there is fullness of joy. At your right hand are pleasures forevermore. In 1 John, we are assured of God's abiding love. So we have come to know and to believe the love that God has for us. God is love, and whoever abides in love abides in God, and God abides in him. And in the end of times, Revelation 21 tells us we will not be forsaken by God. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Behold, the dwelling place of God is with man. He will dwell with them, and they will be his people, and God himself will be with them as their God. Please stand, if you are able, for him 317. declares that God who creates us, God who loves us, God who redeems us, searches us and knows us completely, and we are assured that there is nowhere we can go that is separated from the presence of God. 
Let us pray our prayer of confession and then silently before we say the words of assurance together. Dear Lord and Savior, you have given us so many talents and gifts, including the gift of our very selves, our families, and our society. Yet we, in all of this abundance, sometimes neglect to realize that these are precious gifts. We sometimes fail to put them to use for things of eternal value, instead debasing them with our own temptations to attend to our own comforts and vanities. We sometimes allow others to use us and manipulate us in ways that lead to harm to others and even to ourselves. Lord, we need your forgiveness for these failings. Lord, we repent and ask to live in your love and grace. The Spirit of the Lord has descended upon us, providing grace and comfort. Our guilt has been forgiven, and we will accept the love of God and go and serve Him. We are forgiven. Hallelujah. Suzanne has our time with children. All right, well, it's back to school time, guys. I know, I know. But I know some of you are looking forward to getting those new school supplies out, right? I know that's what I always look forward to. Getting that fresh blank slate, just like this one. Ah, new year, new beginnings, great stuff. So, we all start out with a blank slate. And God gives us some rules, just like there are rules at school. I'm going to step up a bit. All right. Just like there are rules at school. But with, with God, the rules are there because he knows what's best for us. And he's trying to protect us. He may seem like he's trying to take away fun, but he's really not. He's just trying to protect you. Microphone. It's in the way. Um, hold on a second. Because I need my other hand to explain this. Okay. So, like some of the rules, one of the major ones is love the Lord your God with all your heart. That seems pretty easy when, when you're just thinking about it until you actually try to do it. And another one is don't steal. That seems pretty easy too. Until there's something that your sister got that you didn't get. Or... There's also one that says, you know, don't want the things that other people have. But that's really hard because she has the thing you wanted. And here she is right there. Ooh, kind of lopsided. I don't usually draw this way. There she is, all happy about it. Here I am, all sad about it because I didn't get that thing. She has my thing. Or, well, it's really her thing. But I want it to be my thing. And so... I sneak over and I take that thing. She doesn't know. She wasn't playing with it. She didn't even notice. Ha! And then, but later, later she noticed. And she came back and she's like, where's my thing? And I was like, I'm going to get in trouble if they find out I took this thing. So then I do another bad thing and I lie. And then she goes, oh, I know you're lying. And so I make it lie bigger. And pretty soon it just goes crazy, and then I have a mess. Messes are bad. But that's why the rules are there, is so we don't make messes. But sometimes we make them anyway. But that's the good thing about what Jesus did. Because Jesus, like, I knew you were going to make a mess eventually. We all do, right? Except for Jesus. And he comes along, he's like, look, if you admit that you made these mistakes, and and you come to me, I can take those for you. And, and you won't be in this mess anymore. So if he comes along, he'll just 
Mm -hmm. That's why he died on the cross for us, is to make us all clean and white again. And look, well, I don't know that you can see it, because it really doesn't show up that well from a distance, but all that, that mess is now on the cloth, just like it's on Jesus' shoulders. And he took that, and he can handle it a whole lot better than this can. So we're just going to be thankful that he takes those away. And we try not to make those mistakes again and make a mess again, but it'll probably happen. But when it does, we just keep coming back to Jesus. So let's thank him for loving us enough to be our cleaning cloth. Ready? Dear God, thank you so much that you love us enough that you understood that we were going to make mistakes, that even mistakes that hurt us never hurt you when we sin. It hurts us, and that hurts you. Please put that on our hearts as we go through this new school year, be with the kids as they go back to school, keep them safe and healthy, and be with our, the parents as we head back with them in various different forms. In Jesus' name, amen. Pray with me for a moment, please. 
Lord, take my words and turn them into something meaningful for someone here today. Lord, help them see you and not myself. Amen. Since I'm an engineer, my favorite book of the Old Testament outside of Psalms is Numbers. So that's <laughs> a different kind of numbers, but I still like numbers. So our first reading comes from Numbers chapter 12. In fact, it's the whole chapter. But don't worry, it's a short chapter. Miriam and Aaron began to talk again because of his Cushite wife, for he had married a Cushite. Has the Lord spoken only through Moses, they asked? Hasn't he also spoken through us? And the Lord heard this. Now Moses was a very humble man, more humble than anyone else on the face of the earth. I'm just going to repeat that. Now Moses was a very humble man, more humble than anyone else on the face of the earth. At once the Lord said to Moses, Aaron, and Miriam, Come out to the tent of meeting, all three of you. So the three of them went out. Then the Lord came down in a pillar of cloud. He stood at the entrance to the tent and summoned Aaron and Miriam. When the two of them stepped forward, he said, Listen to my words. When there is a prophet among you, I, the Lord, reveal myself to them in visions. I speak to them in dreams. But this is not true of my servant Moses. He is faithful in all my house. With him, I speak face to face, clearly and not in riddles. He sees the form of the Lord. Why then were you not afraid to speak against my servant Moses? The anger of the Lord burned against them, and he left them. When the cloud lifted from above the tent, Miriam's skin was leprous. It had become white as snow. Aaron turned toward her and saw that she had a defiling skin disease, and he said to Moses, Please, my Lord, I ask you not to hold against us the sin we have so foolishly committed. Do not let her be like a stillborn infant coming from its mother's womb with its flesh half eaten away. So Moses cried out to the Lord, Please, God, heal her. The Lord replied to Moses, If her father had spit in her face, would she not have been in disgrace for seven days? Confine her outside the camp for seven days. After that, she can be brought back. So Miriam was confined outside the camp for seven days, and the people did not move on till she was brought back. After that, the people left Hazareth and encamped in the desert of Paran. My second reading is from the New Testament in 1 Corinthians chapter 3. Brothers and sisters, I could not address you as people who live by the Spirit, but as people who are still worldly, mere infants in Christ. I gave you milk, not solid food, for you were not yet ready for it. Indeed, you are still not ready. You are still worldly. For since there is jealousy and quarreling among you, are you not worldly? Are you not acting like mere humans? For when one says, I follow Paul, and another, I follow Apollos, are you not mere human beings? What, after all, is Apollos? And what is Paul? Only servants, through whom you came to believe, as the Lord has assigned to each his task. I planted the seed, Apollos watered it, but God has been making it grow. But God has been making it grow. So neither the one who plants nor the one who waters is anything, but only God who makes things grow. The one who plants and the one who waters have one purpose, and they will each be rewarded according to their own labor, for we are co-workers in God's service. You are God's field, God's building, by the grace God has given me, I laid a foundation as a wise builder, and someone else is building on it, but each one should build with care. For no one can lay any foundation other than the one already laid, which is Jesus Christ. If anyone builds on this foundation using gold, silver, costly stones, wood, hay, or straw, their work will be shown for what it is, because the day will bring it to light. It will be revealed with fire, and the fire will test the quality of each one's work. If what has been built survives, the builder will receive a reward. 
If it is burned up, the builder will suffer loss, but yet will be saved even though only as one escaping through the flames. Don't you know that you yourselves are God's temple and that God's spirit dwells in your midst? If anyone destroy God's temple, God will destroy that person, for God's temple is sacred, and you together are that temple. These are the words of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. So uh, I'm going to begin my talk here with some more numbers because I'm an engineer. So why is church attendance in decline in the U.S.? Or is it? So it turns out, you know, over the last 50 years, from 1965 through 19, uh, sure, excuse me, 2015, 50 years, uh, PCA USA and what became PCA USA has declined from, membership has declined from 4.5 million in 1965 to 1.57 million members in 2015 in 50 years. That's a drop of two-thirds. That's concerning for all of us Presbyterians. Recently, uh, the Pew Research Organization updated their research on religion in America. Uh, in, on July 8th, they, uh, their latest 2020 census of American religion results were released. There's actually some good news in their census this time. Earlier surveys had shown that young people in recent decades had at least in unprecedented numbers been avoiding attending church and had been avoiding even being associated with organized religion. The term that Pew Research gives these people, uh, anyone who's non-affiliated with a religion, their term is nuns, the religious nuns, N-O-N-E-S, nuns. This group of religious nuns grew from less than 10% of the U.S. population in the 1950s to a high of 25% in 2018. That's one in four Americans now who say they're not affiliated with any religion at all. But there's some good news. The latest survey in 2020, uh, for 2020, showed that religious nuns actually decreased from 25.5% in 2018 to 23% in 2020. So that's the first significant decrease in decades of surveys. What's more, the so-called white evangelical segment, which we are cubby-holed into in their way of looking at it. Um, I'm, no, we are not. I'm sorry, the white evangelical, not white mainstream. White evangelical segment declined from 23% to 14.5%, from 2016 to 2020. This means that mainline Protestant churches like ours actually outnumber evangelical churches once again believe it or not. Now, Pew Research is a secular organization, but they have a conclusion about why the decline in mainstream Protestantism has occurred. One of the most important things is that young people disagree with many of the things that uh, evangelicals and mainstream churches have stood for in terms of politics. So, they believe that being associated with politics and having political matters being discussed in the church has turned away a generation of young people. I don't know if they're right, but that's what they say. So clearly there are two things, though, that I don't believe work when you're trying to increase church membership. Number one is don't try to sign Jesus up to your small political passions. Jesus isn't in politics. He's in people. Number two, don't act like Jesus is a brand you're selling and try to recruit people instead of introduce them to Jesus. Because that's what the world does. The world advertises, the world sells, the world tries to recruit. So, am I wrong? Did Jesus get involved in politics? 
No, I don't think so. Much to the disappointment of some of his followers, he didn't. When he criticized political leaders, he was really criticizing the church leaders, Jewish leaders. So, once a year, we, in the church calendar, we return to the book of Acts and read about the early church. Did they build mega buildings? Did they provide entertainment? Did they have glitzy and innovative props and stages? No. They met in people's houses. They focused on building a community of believers. When St. Paul got into action, he preached to the world as far as he could travel. Nationality and heritage were not limitations to being accepted in, in the church. They did require a belief in Jesus. They did require a desire to build up the community of faith. But for most of history, it turns out that the church was not growing in leaps and bounds. Gradually, generation to generation. The book of Acts makes it clear that there were at least several thousand Christians by the middle of the first century which is pretty remarkable considering how few members there were in the beginning, as discussed in Acts chapter 1. Nevertheless, the total number of believers at the end of the first century was probably still very small. Sociologists who are studying this estimate that the number of Christians in the year 100 was probably only 7,500, which is 0.01% of the total population of the Roman Empire. Drawing on his training as a sociologist, Rodney Stark suggests that the general growth rate of the church was only 3.4% per year for the first 300 years. 3.4% per year. While the Christian population of the empire was a very modest number at the end of the first century, it had grown to 10% of the population by the year 300. So, during the explosive growth of the church, the growth of the church was only 3.4% per year. So if this were true in our own congregation, this would be like adding about one family per year, one family per year to our congregation, plus others to replace those who leave, <laughs> of course. But that's based on the growth rate during the growth phase of the church the early phase when the rapid growth occurred. So how does this translate into what we at Waverly Road should be doing to build up our own church? I'm going to turn to Montreat, which is my favorite place. Two years ago, uh, let's see, it's 2020, and uh, we had a, a preacher at, at the worship and music conference named Roger Nishioka. And he was fantastic. You can ask anybody else who was there, which includes some people like Julie and Rachel and Candace and Patty. Um, don't take my word for it. The sermon, uh, the day that I'm talking about that he gave, he gave about five sermons, I believe, was called The Embodiment of Love. And the theme of the conference was not as the world gives. So Roger is a senior pastor in Kansas at a Presbyterian church there. He joined that church after serving 15 years on the faculty of Columbia Theological Seminary. His father is also a Presbyterian pastor. But he had a great story about his family, and his story concerns church growth. You see, when, when Roger Nishioka's mother, Alice, was a little girl, when she was nine years old, Alice, in 1942, she and her parents were interned in a Japanese internment camp in California by the Roosevelt administration, in violation, by the way, of their civil rights and due process by the emergency powers claimed during the war. So Roger's grandparents, who were U.S. citizens who had never even been to Japan themselves, lost everything. They only had 12 days to pack up what they could carry possessions, only what they could carry, and they lost everything else. Roger's mother, Alice, who was nine years old in 1942, was born in the U.S., and she, like her parents, were full U.S. citizens. 
So this is what happened. When the family was forced to leave and board a train, Roger's grandmother, Alice's mother, had forgotten to pack any food and water for the trip. The children were hungry and thirsty while they waited to be loaded on the train. Can you imagine? You've lost everything, you're a young mother, and then your children are crying because they're hungry and thirsty and you have nothing to give them. It's devastating, it's heartbreaking. According to Roger's account, his mother, Alice, then went to see, she was nine years old, remember, she went to see if she could find someone to give them food. The crowd sort of parted for her, and standing there was a tall, white woman with a tray of sandwiches, fruit, and juice. Alice said, excuse me, is this for sale? No, said the woman, this is for you. Take some. But we don't know you, Alice said. I'm a Christian friend, the woman replied. When Alice brought the food back to her brother and mother, she asked where it came from. Alice said, from this white woman who says she's our Christian friend. Alice's mother said, that's not possible. We're Buddhists. We don't know any Christians. They're not our friends. They sent us here. White people hate us. Alice went back to the woman and said, we don't have any white Christian friends. The woman smiled and said, well, you do now. We're Quakers, and we think what's happening to you is wrong. But listen to what happened after that. Three years later, after the war, Roger's mother, Alice, who was 12 years old at this time, became friends with a white girl at school named Sally. Sally was a Nazarene. One day, Sally invited Alice to spend the night and then attend church the next day with her on Sunday. Alice asked her mom if it was okay, but her mother said, no, you have a bed here. Why would you sleep anywhere else? Alice replied, Mama, Sally is a Christian, and she's my Christian friend. Then you may go, said her mother. From there, Alice began attending church, became a Christian, was baptized, and eventually married a man who would become a Presbyterian minister. And their son, Roger, became a Presbyterian minister. And two years ago, he gave this series of blockbuster sermons at Montreat. Roger says that when he gets to heaven, he's going to look for that Quaker woman who gave his mother food when she was nine years old and when they were on their way to an internment camp in Arizona and thank her for changing his life and their family's history forever. So what does this mean? First of all, if you show up and start talking religion, does the person you're talking to see it as good news <laughs> or bad news? Have you listened to them to know what they need and where they are in their faith? Do you know how you can help them? Do you care about them? Secondly, when you tell someone about Christianity, are you telling them how to know about God or how to know about our church? Or are you introducing them to God and showing them who God is? You see, our society is very good about telling people about things. We're also good at telling people what we think they should do, but this is not very effective. My father always said, a man convinced against his will is of the same opinion still. Instead of telling people about Jesus, we need to introduce them to Jesus himself. Being a Christian means knowing Jesus and the Father and the Holy Ghost, not just knowing about God. The cryptic quote puzzle in yesterday's paper <laughs> quoted Samuel Johnson. He said one time, three centuries ago, a horse that can count to ten is a remarkable horse, not a remarkable mathematician. In the same way, you might be a good Christian, but you're not a very good substitute for Jesus. You might be made in the image of God, sure, but you're nothing compared to God himself. Don't show people that you are a horse who can count to ten. Instead, introduce them to the great mathematician, Jesus Christ. You see, what the world needs now is love, of course, 
But not just any kind of love. The world needs the love that comes from God, not the love that the world gives. The love that was modeled by Jesus during his time on earth, the love that acts in the best interest of other people, regardless of our own predilections. If we try to be a country club, we'll fail. We don't even have a golf course. If we try to be a nightclub, we'll just mislead about people about what it is to be a Christian. If we're a bunch of hypocrites, nobody will believe us. Love does not mean putting on a tie-dye shirt and smiling all the time. Love is an action verb acted out by real, fallible people trying to share Christ. Sometimes love includes saying a swear word when you hit your thumb with a hammer as you're trying to build a habitat house. <laughs> Sometimes love means showing up to listen, even though you don't have any solutions. Sometimes love is just a free bag of groceries to help a person along. Sometimes love just means being so real that a person feels free to show up and be who they are and let God do the work. You are one person. Doing your job means helping people around you get to know Christ, not to just to know about Christ. You don't have to preach to 3,000 people. You just need to take care of the people who are walking along the path with you and then let God do the rest. You know, if God is your co-pilot, as they said in the old joke, maybe it's time to switch seats and let him fly the plane. So, I leave you with this. Take heart. We may be the most miserable and adequate people on earth, but God can turn it into something good. Let's just let him do that. Amen. And now, please, if you are able to stand, you're welcome to stand. And say the affirmation of faith printed in your bulletin. We are not alone. We live in God's world. We believe in God who has created and is creating, who has come in Jesus, the Word made flesh, to reconcile and make new who works in us and others by the Spirit. We trust in God. We are called to be the church, to celebrate God's presence, to live with respect in creation, to love and serve others, to seek justice and resist evil, to proclaim Jesus, crucified and risen, our judge and our hope. In life, in death, in life beyond death, God is with us. We are not alone. Thanks be to God. Amen. Thank you. And now let us pray together. Join me as we pray. Dear God, we, we give you so much thanks for being able to be here this morning. We give you thanks for the miracle of health, for the miracle of a blue sky, the miracle of a soft rain, which is more like this morning. We give you thanks for our green, green, beautiful place that we are privileged to live. We give thanks for our neighbors. We give thanks for our friends. We give thanks for the love and help that we have received from those kind strangers. Lord, we give thanks because you are so good to us. Lord, we also know that not all of us are feeling good this morning. Some of us have burdens to bear that the world has put on our shoulders. Lord, convince us that you are in us and with us. Lift us up with encouragement and strength and energy to do the work of God and to not let those burdens distract us from that work. Lord, we ask for those who are in pain, 
to fill a special dose of the Holy Ghost this morning. We ask for healing. We ask for those who don't have what they need to get it. And Lord, we ask you to guide us to help them get it. Lord, we ask for people who are wasting their lives to find someone who can show them a better way. Lord, put that person in their lives. Help them see that there is hope. Lord, we ask that you continue, continue to bless this church and our, in our good community here in Kingsport. Lord, we, we ask that you heard of all of our silent prayers and, and, and our pleas for forgiveness this morning. And, Lord, we continue our tradition in praying the words that Jesus taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. And now our friend Eddie Eldridge is going to come with the mission moment. Thanks, Eddie. I would like to take a moment and talk about a uh, new mission project, the 2021 Faith and Community Build. Holston Habitat for Humanity is part of a global nonprofit housing organization operated on Christian principles that seeks to put God's love into action by building homes, communities, and hope. This fall, several Kingsport churches and community service groups, including Waverly Road, will join in the 2021 Faith and Community Build. They will partner with the new owner, Darlene, to build a new house on Ramsey Avenue near some of our former uh, previous Faith Build houses. As in past Faith Builds, Peter Borg will be the site supervisor and has laid out a seven-week build schedule. Groundbreaking ceremony will be in September. Waverly Road volunteers will work on a Thursday, Friday, and Saturday in mid-November with the specific dates to be announced later. Work will include uh, cabinet work, closets, backroom, bathroom fixtures, trim painting, and landscaping. We will need 10 workers per day for the three days. Habitat will provide the tools and the know-how, and the sign-up will be online. I'll provide the uh, details, instructions in the news sheet on, for sign-up. Volunteers are also needed to provide lunches for the workers during that uh, week. The materials for the faith bills are provided by the participating organizations. Waverly Road will donate $5,000 from our Mission Action Plan for our share of the project. So please pray for this faith bill, for Darlene, for the Holston Habitat professionals, and for our volunteers. Thank you. Thank you, Eddie. Now we're going to sing our prayer of dedication, which is the doxology. doxology. remain standing if you will and we're going to sing you are my strength when I am weak uh, we're going to sing it through twice
Go now and let God guide you every step of the way. Go now and introduce people to God through your actions and love for others.